Hello, and welcome back to Clarity Education Systems. Today, we're going to take a closer look at dopamine pathways, diseases associated with these pathways, and how treatments affect each one. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that plays a key role in the brain's reward and pleasure system. It is involved in regulating movement, motivation, and mood. It is produced in several areas of the brain, including the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area. It can be released in response to a variety of stimuli such as sex and social interactions and drugs. Drugs that increase dopamine activity in the brain can be highly addictive and can lead to long-term changes. Medications that alter dopamine activity, such as antidepressants and antipsychotics, can be used to treat psychotic disorders. Research is ongoing to better understand the role of dopamine in the brain and to develop new treatments for dopamine-related disorders. Now, let's move on a little bit and talk about dopamine pathways within our brain. Dopaminergic pathways refer to the neural pathways in the brain that use dopamine as their primary neurotransmitter. Each pathway has its own distinct function. These pathways are involved in complex neural circuits that allow the brain to integrate information and respond to changes in the environment. Dysfunction in the dopaminergic pathways has been implicated in a range of neurological and psychiatric disorders, including Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, addiction, and depression. The mesolimbic pathway is a dopaminergic neural pathway in the brain that is involved in the processing of reward and pleasure. It is part of the larger mesocortical limbic system. The mesolimbic pathway originates in the ventral tegmental area, or the VTA. These neurons project to several regions in the brain, including the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala. The nucleus accumbens, which is part of the basal ganglia, is a key component of the mesolimbic pathway and is often referred to as the brain's reward center. When activated by dopamine release, it produces feelings of pleasure and motivation, which can reinforce behaviors that lead to reward. The amygdala, on the other hand, is involved in the processing of emotional stimuli, such as fear and anxiety, and is also involved in the formation of memories. When there is too much dopamine in the mesolimbic pathway, it can lead to a range of neurological and psychiatric disorders. Excessive dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens can produce feelings of euphoria and reinforce behaviors that lead to reward, such as drug use. Addiction is one of the most well-known disorders that can result from excessive dopamine release in the mesolimbic pathway. Drugs such as cocaine, amphetamines, and opioids can increase dopamine release, leading to feelings of pleasure and reinforcing the drug use. Over time, these drugs can lead to long-term changes in the brain's reward system, making it increasingly difficult to quit. Gambling and overeating are also associated with increased dopamine levels in the mesolimbic. Schizophrenia is another disorder that has been linked to dysfunction in the mesolimbic pathway. Excessive dopamine release in this pathway may contribute to positive symptoms such as hallucinations and delusions. The mesocortical pathway connects the ventral tegmental area to the prefrontal cortex. The mesocortical pathway is involved in a range of cognitive and emotional functions, including working memory, attention, motivation, and emotional regulation. It plays a critical role in higher-order cognitive processes, such as decision-making and problem-solving. Dysfunction in the mesocortical pathway has been linked to a range of psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and depression. In ADHD, dysfunction in the mesocortical pathway may contribute to problems with attention and working memory. In schizophrenia, decreased dopamine in the mesocortical projection to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is thought to be responsible for negative and depressive symptoms of schizophrenia, such as blunted affect, allergia or reduction in quantity of words spoken, abolition, reduced goal-directed activity due to decreased motivation, asociality, and anhedonia, or a reduced experience of pleasure. The nigrostriatal pathway plays a key role in movement control. It connects the substantia nigra to the dorsal striatum, a region of the basal ganglia that is involved in movement control. The striatum receives input from other regions of the brain and uses this information to help coordinate movement. Dysfunction of the nigrostriatal pathway is associated with Parkinson's disease and neurodegenerative disorder that is characterized by tremors, rigidity, and difficulty with movement. In Parkinson's disease, the neurons in the substantia nigra that produce dopamine degenerate, 
leading to a reduction in dopamine levels in the striatum. Treatment for Parkinson's disease often involves medications that increase dopamine levels in the brain, such as levodopa. The nigrostriatal pathway is also involved in addiction, as dopamine release in the striatum is associated with the rewarding effects of drug abuse. Chronic drug use can lead to changes in the nigrostriatal pathway, which can contribute to the development of addiction. The tuberoinfundibular pathway connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. Recall that the hypothalamus is a small area in the brain that plays a crucial role in regulating a variety of physiological processes, including hunger, thirst, body temperature, and the sleep-wake cycle. The pituitary is a small gland located at the base of the brain that is responsible for producing and releasing various hormones that regulate many bodily functions. The tuberoinfundibular pathway is involved in the regulation of hormone secretion from the pituitary, particularly in the release of the hormone prolactin. The dopamine released by neurons in the hypothalamus inhibits the secretion of prolactin from the pituitary gland. This feedback mechanism helps to regulate the levels of prolactin in the body and maintain normal hormonal balance. Blocking of endogenous dopamine receptors by drugs, such as antipsychotics, that compete for the same sites, leads to increased secretion of prolactin, resulting in amenorrhea or an irregular period, infertility, breast milk production or galactorrhea, and gynecomastia or breast production. This also causes reduced sex drive in both men and women. Next, let's discuss how antipsychotics affect the dopaminergic pathways and why it's so important for prescribers to understand these pathways as well as the medications that they're prescribing for these particular pathways because it will greatly affect their care plans and how the patients react and ultimately continue taking their medications. Antipsychotic drugs are classified into two main categories. First, we have typical. Next, we have atypical antipsychotics. Both types affect the dopamine pathways in the brain, but they do so in slightly different ways. Typical antipsychotics, also known as first-generation antipsychotics, primarily block dopamine D2 receptors in the mesolimbic. Recall that overactivity of this pathway has been implicated in the development of positive symptoms of schizophrenia. By blocking dopamine D2 receptors in the mesolimbic, Typicals can reduce the overactivity of the pathway and alleviate these positive symptoms. However, blockage of dopamine D2 receptors will occur in all other pathways as well, and this can lead to side effects. For example, side effects can include EPS symptoms, such as disorders known as echesthesia, Parkinsonianism, and dystonia, as well as sedation, weight gain, dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, sexual dysfunction, and neuroleptic malignant syndrome, all caused by typical antipsychotic use. In the mesocortical pathway, typical antipsychotics can worsen the negative symptoms by blocking dopamine D2 receptors. When dopamine activity is decreased in the mesocortical pathway, it can lead to a decrease in the activity of the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for those executive functions, such as decision-making, planning, and working memory. This can worsen negative symptoms of schizophrenia, such as apathy and lack of motivation, as well as cognitive symptoms, such as difficulty with attention and memory. Furthermore, typical antipsychotics may also block other neurotransmitter receptors, such as serotonin and acetylcholine, which can contribute to negative symptoms and cognitive impairment. Blocking dopamine within the nigrostriatal pathway will cause EPS, such as Parkinsonism, referring to those symptoms that are similarly seen in Parkinson's disease, including tremors, stiffness, and slow movement, akesthesia, restlessness, and the inability to sit still, often described as anxiety or agitation, dystonia, referring to muscle contractions that can cause abnormal postures or movements, often affecting the face, neck, or limbs, and tardive dyskinesia, a potentially irreversible condition characterized by repetitive, involuntary movements of the face, tongue, and limbs. Tardive dyskinesia can be dose-related and can occur within days or weeks of starting treatment or may appear months or even years after the treatment. They can be distressing and have significant impact on quality of life and in some cases may lead to discontinuation of treatment by the patient. As we've learned, the tuber and pathway is involved in the regulation of prolactin secretion. By blocking dopamine receptors in this pathway, 
Typicals can increase prolactin levels, which can cause significant side effects such as galactorrhea, gynecomastia, irregular menstrual cycles, and decreased libido. These side effects can be distressing and can have a significant impact on quality of life and in some cases may lead to discontinuation of treatment. To review, it is important to note that while typical antipsychotics can be effective in treating psychotic symptoms, such as delusions and hallucinations, the potential side effects of these medications should be carefully considered. One of the most commonly reported side effects of typical antipsychotics is EPS, which can be distressing and can affect a patient's quality of life. The development of tardive dyskinesia, a potentially irreversible condition characterized by repetitive, involuntary movements of the face, tongue, and limbs, can also be particularly distressing and can lead to social stigma and embarrassment for the patient. In addition to a movement-related side effects, typicals can cause weight gain, sedation, dry mouth, constipation, and blurred vision. Luckily, this is not the only side to the story regarding dopaminergic pathways and treatment. Atypicals, also known as second-generation antipsychotics, are a class of medications used to treat psychotic disorders. Unlike typical antipsychotics, atypicals target both dopamine and serotonin receptors. This dual mechanism of action is thought to contribute to the lower risk of EPS symptoms. In addition to their effects on dopamine and serotonin receptors, atypical antipsychotics also have a range of other effects on the brain, including modulating the activity of other neurotransmitter systems, such as glutamate, GABA, and acetylcholine. While atypicals have fewer and less severe side effects than typicals, due to the blockage of both D2 and serotonin 5-HT2-alpha receptors, they are still associated with metabolic changes, sedation and drowsiness, cardiac effects, and neurological deficits. In this video, we discuss the common dopaminergic pathways, which include the mesolimbic, mesocortical, nigrostriatal, and tuberinfundibular pathways, and how they can play an important role in disease processes such as Parkinson's disease, substance abuse disorders, and schizophrenia. Additionally, we discuss treatment options using both first-generation antipsychotics, known as typical antipsychotics, and a second-generation antipsychotic, known as an atypical. Thank you for watching. This is an overview of the material found in our on-demand PMHMP review course. This has been Dr. Rossi with Clarity Education Systems. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel to receive more PMHMP exam prep materials.